angels came and ministered to him. Just after Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. At his baptism, Jesus heard the voice of his father identifying him as his beloved son. Jesus will be put to the test. He is God, divine, but he has been born as a man. Jesus shared our human nature fully. Jesus will experience all the aspects of being human, including temptation, temptations that we all experience. But unlike us, his temptations will not lead to sin. How would we respond to the temptations that Jesus faced? Turning stones into bread, we would never be hungry. Putting ourselves in danger due to our recklessness, we would be powerful. Giving ourselves to the dark one, worshiping evil in the world, putting ourselves first, we would have whatever we wanted. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. It is an understatement to say he was hungry. The tempter approached him. The devil tried tempting Jesus three times. The first two temptations the devil starts with, if you are the son of God. Jesus knows he is the son of God. The devil knows he is the son of God. We know that he is the son of God. Just a few verses earlier, we read that God the Father said after Jesus' baptism, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Who doesn't know that Jesus is the son of God? The world doesn't know it. The world only sees his ordinariness, his mortal weakness, his humility. The world then and the world today doesn't know that Jesus is the son of God. If they knew it, would the world behave the way it does? If we know it, does our behavior show it? In the first reading, we hear about the story in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were tempted, but they failed. They gave in to temptation. But the tempter is clever. He first places doubt in Eve's mind. Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the, any of the trees in the garden? Eve responds, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden except this one. I can imagine Eve thinking, is that right? I think I have it right. She tells the tempter, you shall not eat it or even touch it lest you die. The devil disputes that fact. You certainly will not die. Then the devil promises something untrue. No, God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is evil. Satan's temptation is sly. He knows Jesus is hungry. He is just acknowledging that as son of God, Jesus could turn the stones into bread, but Jesus will not follow the instructions of the devil. Jesus says it is written, one does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. When we pray, do we ask God to do something powerful to just prove that he is the son of God? Then the devil took Jesus to the holy city. Again, he starts with, if you are the son of God, he tells him to throw himself down off the high parapet of the temple. The angels will support him. Jesus replies, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. How many times do we put God to the test? Do we ask for miracles only to be disappointed that we did not get exactly what we asked for? Then the third temptation, the devil does not begin with if you are the son of God. This time the devil is putting himself in the place of God. He shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and promises to give them to Jesus only if he prostrates himself and worships the devil. Jesus replies to him, get away Satan, it is written, the Lord your God shall you worship, and him alone shall you serve. The devil could not deliver the kingdoms of the world. However, he does exert influence on them. He tears them down. He makes them turn away from God. Do we worship what these kingdoms represent? Do we worship what the devil promises us? Or do we hear and understand what Jesus is saying? 
The Lord your God shall you worship, and him alone shall you serve. As we begin our 40 days of Lent, we are preparing ourselves to celebrate Easter. Almost 800 people came for ashes on Ash Wednesday. What a great start. But where does it go from there? I can't speak for others, but I am focusing on almsgiving, prayers, and fasting. Will I turn my life around? Jesus defeated the tempter as a man in a human way, using only the weapons that are at hand also for us. Today we are warned and reminded that the devil exists, that he is our enemy and he does not sleep. Sometimes he leaves us more or less alone. Sometimes he ferociously assaults us. Sometimes with great subtlety, he invites us to commit minor infidelities. Sometimes more openly, he urges us to complete betrayal. But we never have to consent. On our own, we are weak and liable to fall, but we are never alone. We stand in the power of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus, who never ceases to feed us with his word and with himself. And in any case of necessity, he will send his holy angels to defend us, to care for all our needs, and to lead us unfailingly to our heavenly homeland. The responsorial today, the responsorial psalm today is from Psalm 51. So remember that and you get a chance during Lent, read Psalm 51. All priests and deacons recite this prayer almost every Friday morning. A couple Friday mornings they have something else. It says, have mercy on me, God, in your kindness. In your compassion, blot out my offense. O oh, wash me more and more from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. My offenses, truly, I know them. My sin is always before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned. What is evil in your sight I have done that you may be justified when you give sentence and be without reproach when you judge. O oh, see, in guilt I was born, a sinner was I conceived. Indeed, you love truth in the heart. Then in the secret of my heart, teach me wisdom. O oh, purify me, then I shall be clean. O oh, wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear rejoicing and gladness that the bones you have crushed may revive. For my sins turn away your face and blot out all my guilt. A pure heart create for me, O God. Put a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, nor deprive me of your Holy Spirit. And it goes on. That's only about half the prayer. So please, please read it during Lent. During this Lent, remember this. Let go let God. It's an old saying. Let go, let God. Let me tell you a story. A man named Jack was walking along a steep cliff one day when he got too close to the edge and he fell over. On the way down, he managed to grab a branch, but as he hung there, he heard the branch begin to crack. He couldn't hang on to the branch much longer, so Jack began yelling for help, hoping that someone would hear and rescue him. Jack yelled, help, is anyone up there? He yelled for a long time, but no one heard him. He was about to give up when he heard a voice. Jack, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, I'm down here. I can see you, Jack, are you all right? Yes, but who are you and where are you? I am the Lord, Jack, I'm everywhere. The Lord, you mean God? Yes, that's me. I'll do anything, Lord, just tell me what to do. God said, Jack, do you trust me? Yes, Lord, I trust you completely. Okay, let go of the branch. What? I said, let go of the branch, just trust me, let go. Jack froze for a moment. Then Jack called out, is there anybody else up there? Letting go and putting all our trust in God is hard. But during this Lent, 
let go and let God 